Hey everyone, it's Joe Glines here from Dallas. Yeah, and Jackie here from Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah, and uh, welcome to the 65th Auto Hotkey webinar. Um, this it just makes me feel old. Um, the fact that we're doing it on the 65th one once a month. So, anyway, and uh, today we're going to be talking about functions in Auto Hotkey and, and nothing too sexy, but we're going to start off with the basics and you know, introduce you to some of the built in Auto Hotkey functions, how to use them, and then cover some other exciting stuff. But first off, let's uh, let's get into some of the uh, things. So there was 123 people registered. We all start off muted, not because, you know, we like to hear ourselves talk. It's just because, you know, once you get more than two people, it's mayhem if everyone tries to talk. So if you have a question, Jackie and I are both watching the chat. Um, just, just chime in there. And uh, if you have a question, you can write it there or just say you have a question. And at one point, you know, whichever one of us is talking, the other person will will wait and and then interrupt us and then you know maybe you can unmute yourself if it's a longer question right it's it's all it boils down to so let's go ahead and get moving um the last here are the last three podcasts that we did the the very this one are the seven reasons to talk to others about your programming i again i iterate that oh and these are built so i can copy and paste into this chat in case you don't have them handy but um it's, it's something, obviously, I'm a big believer in, and so is Jackie, but talking, they don't have to be programmers, right? But talking to other people, especially if they're at a different level than you, and it's a win-win because it's just we think differently. And when you talk to other people about what you're working on, and it it's just you learn so much, and then you find even ideas that you wouldn't have done yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great tool. Uh, even... Depending on whatever you're doing, it might be debugging stuff, but it might also just be you struggling on some kind of puzzle or whatever it might be. It's still a great idea to just talk to someone about your program. Yeah, and if if you don't, quote unquote, have a buddy, you know, it does come back to the whole bobblehead kind of approach, too, is where you can have a, a figure, you know, something in front of you and talk to it and um Often, by you vocalizing and explaining what the thing is you're working on to the thing, you solve it yourself. And it sounds ludicrous until you do it a couple of times and you realize that it really does work. So, and here's the thing, you know, I've talked to, I've worked with, now Jackie, actually, you're the, you're the exception to my rule on this, but like working with Tank and Maestrieth and Isaias and Hellbent, all those guys who to me are, you know, and, and Jean Alain too, it's like, they're all much better programmers than I am, but they often talk out loud while they're doing their program they're they're explaining it to themselves even not to me they're just they're just talking while they're working and i think that's just a normal trait for programmers they, they get in the habit of it because it, it, it helps yeah okay yeah, I, i'd say one of the things i also had with the talking to people about my programming was um i had actually developed something that uh, turned out to be quite valuable and I kept it to myself until someday I had a great buddy over and we started talking about it. And it was like, that's amazing. I know at least a handful of people who actually pay for that. And from there, it took off. So, yeah. No, it's a great point, Jackie. It's uh, it's funny what we take for granted, right? And it's little things like the my screen clipping tool, like the, you know this, this thing, which... Um, Hellbent's working on, on a few more advancements. We're going to get that out here in a bit. But that or the pasting of plain text, those two things, to me, I've I've had them for so long and I use them so much, but um, I forget how for some people, those are game changers, right? Of like, oh man, those saved me so much time. So yeah, just, just talking through what you're doing. And for a while also, that was why I was making those series on, uh, you know, what I've automated with auto hotkey lately, because other people do stuff and you don't even think about like, Oh, you know what? I do something similar to that, right? And you just don't even realize that you should have automated, you know, what it is that you're working on. Yeah. So, all right, let's get moving on now. Um, this script highlight, I found last, I think it was the last webinar, if not the one before, we had talked a little bit about the time zone stuff. And, and I think I had mentioned, let me, let me post this. Oh, come on. I'll post the link here. This is the link to the one that on that's on the forum from G's Wig. He he had a post on the forum on how to 
pull up, it'll, it'll go get times around the world. Um, and then it displays like four of them, but the, and this is the, the GUI that he has. And, um, I exchange emails with him sometimes. So I just wrote him and said, Hey, you know, what's conf- this, I get confused on which time zone goes with which drop down. So to me, wouldn't it be cool if we had these things side by side and it's much easier. So I think, I, let me, let me load. Yeah. This is the, the, the version he, he very quickly redid it. Um, and so here you can see, you can come in and change, you know, this to a different time zone and it updates. Um, so I just thought, Hey, that, this is pretty slick. It gets the, the universal time zone and then he has it filtering. Now this is just, to me, it's the beginnings of what could be a really cool script because there's no um, saving of preferences, right? What I would think is it, this should be whatever I choose as the dropdown saves it as a preference. And then every time I load it, it has those listed cities. And so, cause most people you work in five or six places, right. And um, it's very convenient to have those, but um, what he does, what I thought when I first looked at the script, I thought he's using like the world clock API to connect to and do this calculation. But what he does is he's just looking at your registry and getting the current time zone, you know, and then comparing it, that, number right with with where the utc is and then he goes through and picks some because it's all you have to know is what time zone the person's in off their system right and you can base everything else from that so i thought that was pretty slick yeah um if you're interested in that second version uh the sideways one the the horizontal version of it uh that one here so yeah so all right now let's get into some fun so uh, what is a function now here and actually this this very first I think maybe I changed a slight bit of it but this first description a function is similar to a subroutine or go sub except that it can accept parameters or inputs from its caller uh, in addition a function may return may optionally return a value slash values to its caller and I think that's where I changed it slightly but once you understand that a function it really is like a go sub except for it's much more powerful in that you can just pass you know a parameter or multiple parameters to it uh, it allows you to make your go subs adaptable easily adaptable you know and, and then you don't have to have 80 different go subs you can have one and change a couple different parameters each time you call it and, and it's just it's such a game changer it's hard to explain any more than that of, of what it does do you have anything else on that jackie that you say <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it it one of the big parts is of course the saving of how many times you need to write the same thing. If you're doing something similar, you could probably adapt a function to do it more uh, widely with the right parameters um, and and save yourself a lot of headaches and I don't know spaghetti code. So yeah, it, it, you know, and I should have added this in in the comments is uh. The other thing, and this is after years of working with Maestri, him and I for a couple of years, we just spent all day together on Zoom and just doing this stuff. And you can do your best to try to plan ahead about what will be a function, but you don't always catch it. Often you'll write something and then you write another one and then you realize, wait a minute, these are really the same thing just with that one parameter change. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back, reverse it, convert it to a function and pass the parameter. Um, and sometimes that happens multiple times where you realize you can nest it even one more back and, and, it, and it's, it's just a very powerful concept. Uh, yeah. So let me put these links here. These are some good resources. Uh, there are, well, and I found that the, the one that's post, uh, it links to the HK functions. Now, I don't know if this is all of the built-in functions, but it was broken out in a list. So those are on the forum and there's a lot of amazing, that's why I think, I feel there's more than 66 but I counted in that list 66, but I have a feeling there's more than that. Uh, and then this post is a post where, so in auto hockey, there's commands and functions, right? In the commands, you, you, it's hard when you first start using auto hotkey to see the distinction, but functions will end with the, the two parens at the end of them, because you can either, you know, pass a parameter or not, but they have the parens at the end, the gosa, or sorry, um, commands don't have the parens on them. And, uh, Anyway, this link in it, if you go to it, Polythene had gone back and converted all of the commands at the time, at least, into functions because functions have some really great benefits, which we list down here below, but they're very cool. And then this post also from Dizwig where he had backported a lot of functionality from AutoHockey version two 
you know, into version one, which is pretty cool. If you're not ready to make the switch to version two, you can actually use some of that cool stuff that's in version two uh, in uh, 1.1. Actually, I should say version one. one. Oops. Whoa. Hey, not help. Sorry. Now, some of the main benefits. All right. So, and, and we're going to go through this in some code here in a few minutes, but I just, and I'll, I'll do a screen clip hopefully so I remember most of these. But uh, you can uh, use, they can use it without storing a value, which it sounds simple but uh, or basic, but that's a very cool thing where you don't have to store the value if you don't want to. Uh, you can have multiple functions on one line. And again, this doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you're writing a lot of code, it, it's very convenient to have more than one on one line. Uh, it fits inside nope. an expression, right? So, fits inside what? An expression. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then scope. This is one of those things. It, it is the thing that will trip you up the most when you first start using functions. It's it. It's a blessing and a curse. At the beginning, you'll hate it, but you'll realize there's some really big advantages of scope, mostly being local and what you're doing in there, and the things are. Uh, self-contained in that sense. Uh, but you can, with a function, often I'll find other people's stuff and I'll look at the code and it's very dense and I'll go through it and go, you know what? All I want to do is I want to create my own wrapper for this thing. And I just want to be able to change these two parameters. And so I'll just write a small wrapper in a function and just allow me the two parameters I want to change, uh, you know, in as the parameters that I call in the function. And I don't have to go dig into every time I want to change the code or do whatever. I just work on those parameters and I don't have to read through the whole thing that someone else did. Not knocking what they did. It's just for me, like, I don't, I don't want to have to try to read through this dense code. I want to do that once and then make it simple for myself. And of course, with a DLL call, uh, th these are function calls, right? And the fact is that you can out uh, access the thousands. I don't know if it's, you know, tens of thousands or whatever, but there's a crazy amount of functions built into DLLs that we have access to. And it's great that AutoHotKey has that functionality. Let's use the pun on functionality. Um, and then of course, a variadic function is something that allows you to have multiple parameters, as many, you know, I don't know if there is a, do you know, Jackie, is there a max number of? Uh, I've, I've not read up on it. So right. I don't know for sure if then, there probably is a max, but yeah, yeah I don't I know believe there is, yeah. right. Um, and maybe someone will chime in here um, or we'll go search for it while we're going through this here. But uh, all right, let's go into here. So as we said, AutoHockey has a lot of built-in functions. Here's a couple. Now, I just wanted to, to work on them here. And then here in a second, we'll switch into the code. Um, but the like substring is a great function. Notice here's the, the paren, right? And paren. Um, the, the blue stuff here, these are required parameters. Right, so for substring, you need a string, you need a starting position, but the length, anything between these uh, orange brackets, it, it, on, on these, like this one has a lot of optional parameters. This one just has one, <laughs> one. It has one, so you can decide if you if you don't give it one, it'll use the entire length starting in a given position. Uh, but you can provide one, and it will it will use that length. Uh, round um, the number the. the N, how many digits is optional. So I think the default is zero. Uh, but you can, you know, add a dig add a number here to say how many digits you want to round to. Uh, trim, just like trim. It can trim either white space or other characters, you know, from your code, but that one doesn't have any required or optional parameters. Oh no, there's there's optional parameters. Sorry, I don't I, I thought I looked at that. So let's um, I'll look at that here in a second. Um, and stir split again, just you can have this, the string is required, but the uh, these other parameters are optional. Um, so you can choose the delimiters or emit characters or max parts. Um, it's very cool stuff. So this also, correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie, as far as the, the brackets and um, the parens, that's pretty standard in other languages as well, right? Anything that's between the the brackets are usually optional. Isn't that correct? When you look at help, I've, I've at least seen it uh, more than once for sure. Okay, well, let's go ahead and let me um, let me go back. Hold on one second here, and I'm going to use this little screen clipping tool just so I have these handy. And let's switch over to Studio to example one. 
where we start off with some built-in functions. And this, you know, just because it confuses people, I'll comment that out, uh, but in it, so that's really, it. I have hotkeys that launch and reload scripts for me and that, that's really, that's all that's in there in the single license force and some other junk, but the, really the only important one is a single license force for this purpose. And here, the substring function, right? This is the other thing, by the way, using AutoHotKey Studio compared to like a uh, site for AutoHotKey, which is a great editor. Uh, uh, AutoHotKey Studio, notice when I'm in each one of these, it's highlighting where I am in the parameters. Uh, that is really, really helpful, obviously, because it'll tell you where you are. Because on a on a function or a command that has a lot of parameters, it can be very confusing on where you are in that inside that thing. Um, here, I'm not even. Here's an example where I'm calling substring on this string, and this could have been a variable without the quotes or the text here. And we're saying start at the fourth position and return three characters. So if we say one, two, three, four, so it's gonna start here and it's gonna return three. So when I run this, hey, it grabs ABC. Now notice here, I didn't save this in a variable and then display the results, right? This is one of those things I was saying earlier. Uh, it, it's very convenient because I wouldn't wanna to have to um, do that. You know, if I never, if I'm just using this in something else, it's very convenient to be able to access this. Uh, I could wrap this whole thing and say, Use the typing. Uh, now, when I run this, um, see how the result is ABC, right? Again, I didn't save that anywhere, it's, and I have it right in my, you know, my my syntax. So very, very helpful to me. Uh, is there is anyone, you know, on on the call? Least, you know, is that too much for anybody? Do I need to slow down? I think that's pretty straightforward overall. Um, this next one we're going to go into, if, if it's not, you know, oh, there is no limitation mentioned in the doc for variadic functions. Thank you, John. Um, and let's see here. So the next one here, where it looks like he's using trim. And so here I put in a variable, in the variable name text. Joe was here, but notice the space here and, and the wrap here. So let's, you know what, let's, let's do this twice. So. Make this sim similar. Wrap. So now, when I run this, notice how there, not there's or two. It's not. You didn't wrap wrap in um, string. Um, what are those called? I don't remember. The quotes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but it's still it. It didn't. I mean, I wasn't trying. To my okay. my point was to show the the pipes next to it, right? Like in the first one, there's a space here, right? It's not getting, it's not trimming out, it's not removing the uh, the white space, this white space. No, I, I I get that. I was just saying that the wrap in your first message box those just disappear because they're empty variables. But aren't they there? No. In line right, seven, what, about understanding. Why is that not going to work? In, in it's it's working. It's not an error per se. But you oh. don't have a variable. Oh yeah, you do. Oh, is that me? Oh. Wow. Oh, thank God, I'm like, what? Okay. What am I missing? Okay. I totally missed that. Nice. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so so here there's the space after it. This next one, look, no space, right? So we're just simply trimming. And here again, I called the trim function within my line of code. And I'm and I didn't tell it what to trim, but it automatically trims the white space. And actually, if I remember correctly, it'll trim from both sides by default. So there's a space on both sides. This time it gets rid of both of them. Right. So very simple thing here where we're, you know, dropping out the uh these character, um, the, sorry, the spaces, the white space uh, by default. Now, if I wanted to, let's say, and now correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie, let's say um, this was here, 
And on here, I did a comma. No, I was just going to omit. Yeah, I don't want to omit them. Uh, my bad. I was going to say I wanted to. I wanted to trim the pipes, but it just omits the characters. I can't specify the character, can I? No. Trim. Okay. Well, let's not worry about that. So I'm going to go ahead and let me undo those two, save, okay, and let me go grab my other um, example two. So here, now we're building, we're getting into using custom functions, right? Custom functions we build. We build. Um, and, and, you know, I should have put this in the deck here. I'm calling the function. And this is where I'm actually, you know what? let's put this up here. So right here, I'm defining the function, right? And to define the function, you give it a name um, and then you can either give it default values or not. In this case, I'm giving, I'm defining default values. This one will have default as one. Var two is gonna have the word two and var three is gonna be empty by default. Um, and then at the end, so here, this is where we put our second param and then we have a bracket, a curly brace, excuse me. And this, everything inside here to the end, from here to here is in my function. And in the function, all I'm doing is displaying what these, uh, here are the parameters, right? We're passing, I'm sorry, I shouldn't click there. So var one, var two, and var three are parameters. Um, and here, not that the casing matters, I just wanted to match. Um, we're just displaying them and that's gonna be a variable inside here, right? Cause now it's a variable cause we passed it to that thing. Um, hey, Joe, Joe, would it make sense to put some kind of wrap uh, of like pipes at the end uh, so that you can actually see that the three is not there on the last line? Sure, well, we can do that. Um, so here, yeah. Oh, actually, that one I can just put inside there. There we go. All right, so, and I'm going to leave this, but this is just all, again, it has the single license force and a hotkey to, I need to kill the scripts, sorry. Let me kill the other two. So I'm going to launch it. Now, right now it's running. When I hit my hotkey, so there's our one, two, and then, oh, we here, we passed three, and sorry, I should have stepped in this. Notice that this is empty, this is empty. And the third one, I gave it a value of three, right? So I'm defining the first two I'm leaving empty. Well, if I hadn't defined them here, if like, watch what happens if I this save it and reload it. Now it says, hey, this this is a blank parameter. It's, it's this can't head off it this way because you can't have optional parameters at the beginning. Um, you can only have those, you know, after you've defined stuff. So did I say that right, Jackie? They, they can't be on the left side. <laughs> yeah, it, that sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, so when I save this and reload it, now, oops, get rid of that. So now it's fine, um, but look, let's say I wanted to say this is, um, who's here? Let's see, uh, Dale. So now when I run this, I'm gonna hit my hotkey now, and notice it brought in Dale, right? Because here I said, hey, let's define the first parameter var one as Dale, it comes in here. This is only, this only, ha this only gets used if I didn't give it a parameter. You're setting a default value for it, right? But if there's something there, it's gonna use what gets passed. And so that's why the message box here has Dale up here because we passed a parameter um, and here, uh, Susan I saw was on. So we'll say reload run. So we're passing those two now in, um, it's uh, working hopefully the way we would think. Does that make sense to everybody? Hopefully this is, I know I could have explained them a little clearer at the beginning, but hopefully it's it's starting to make sense here um, as far as yeah, how they're and, used. And if you went in and removed all the passing of parameters when you are calling the function, this one would still work because all of them actually are, um, defined or have default values. 
Well, yeah, right. I, I'm taking it the reverse way um, is because when we're calling it now, we get we we're get providing the each um, parameter. Um, these can be blank, and everything will work perfectly fine, right? So that'll work. Uh, but what Jackie was saying is, uh, if it was still this way. Um, Because we have default values for each one, uh, actually, I can just clear all that out, right? Yeah. Um, this will work too, and that was earlier why Jackie had me put the pipe here in case there's nothing there. Because I've set these up, and so often it is very convenient and smart to define default values. Uh, because sometimes, hey, I don't, I want to have it where I don't have to tell it anything. Just call my function and use the defaults, right? And oftentimes, when you're programming, you'll realize there's a very clear reason, you know. Um, there's a very clear default value to have that you'd want to have in there, right? And I only want to change that if, you know, I'm, I'm working on something specific. And would it allow you to pass an empty variable as, let's say, var1? Let's say var4 or something. So like that is what you're saying? No, no, that's a blank string. I, I wanted you to actually pass... Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So like that. Content. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't sure the answer to that. Yeah. 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 I wasn't sure either, but I do believe it actually just is a blank uh, yeah. string or something. And, and um, hopefully this will help too, but with AutoHotKey, right, I could define something up here and just use that variable Oh, I forgot my equal sign. My bad. Save, reload, and run it. Oh, there we go. So I'm storing Joe in var one, and then I'm just including that variable here when I call it. Right. So if you're, because my thoughts are, if you if you haven't used functions, maybe a lot of this is voodoo to you. Right. So this could be you can either give it the actual value or you can pass it a variable. Right. It, the auto hockey doesn't care. You can even pass objects, which I end up doing a lot. It's a great, easy way to give it a lot of data. Um, and we'll get into here in a few minutes on how to return uh, a lot of data. Did, did anybody have yeah. any questions on that? Oh, I'm not sure if you two changes, but this should find it interesting that default arguments cannot be objects. Default arguments cannot be objects. Yeah, so the default parameters cannot be set up as objects, as they're not truly expressions that will be interpreted as objects. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so let me uh, get back into here. So number three, all right, the by rep. Now, um, a lot of people, including me, I don't want to say I don't see the point in a by ref because I, I understand it, I get it, but I just don't like using them. I'd rather... Um, return uh, an object, which, you know, most of the time, and Jackie helped me, you know, in this one, people use a by ref because you want, not always, but one big reason is you want to return more than one value. And actually I should have had, which I thought I did, but my, my bad, I, I didn't work through it entirely. Uh, let's say in here, um, here's my by ref function. I'm going to get rid of some of the stuff for now. Let me simplify this. Let's say I wanted to return um, a value, right? So return, um, let's just say uh, test. And here I'm going to define test is equal to taco. Uh, now up here, if I want to return one value, right, um, I need to, because I'm returning it, I'm going to return test, which is a variable, but it's going to have a value in it. I could I could just do this. I could say message box percent and run this. Now when I hit my hotkey, it says taco. Why is that? Because this called the function that one was a value, but that really doesn't matter in this case. It jumped into here. Test got stored. I'm sorry, taco got stored in test. We returned test, and that's what showed up here. Now what be a little might be a little more clear is if we said um, Now returned value, right, is stored, because now we've stored that value in a variable, and that's what most people, you don't just 
return a value and use it, although that definitely can't happen. But we're gonna, and if I run this, the same thing's gonna happen, right? But the point is now you've returned it and stored it in something. But what if you want more than one value return from a function? And that's where this functions for that sense break down because you can only, you know, return it using the return thing. You can return one thing is a better way to say it, right? So the by ref helps get around that. Um, and Jackie, do you agree with me on the, the buyer that most of the time, that's the biggest reasons you want to return more than one value? Is that why they're used? It's at least one of the reasons, but I would also say one of the reasons I've seen used quite a bit is if the content of the variable is large, you know, uh, fills up a lot of space. You can save... <laughs> A bit of okay. space by using by ref yep. because you're just using the same memory address instead of copying it over, so to speak. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. If that was. Yeah. Um, if that was. I avoided using the example on the forum, and and the example on the forum was stressing your point, um, but to me it was just it was very confusing. I didn't want people to start off that way because. It, it was you're swapping around things and to me it was just it it's more abstract than anything else um, but it uh it, to your point jackie what happens is like here i've created a variable called one and i'm storing the value of the the digit one in it um and i call let's go ahead and get rid of this we don't need this anymore um i call my by ref my thing i call by ref function passing it this variable one which has the character one uh, but here, notice this, this word by ref, this is the, the secret sauce here, right? This basically says, hey, this one we're using here, instead of being its own thing, it's going to be referencing this up here and using that same memory. Is that, that was your point, right, Jackie? That yeah. it's because uh, uh, when we shove, you know, in here, and this is why I want to say, let me, let me save it and, and walk through it as I hit it. So I'm going to hit the hotkey. Uh, so in function one, and is one. So see how that is? This is before this, right? But now I'm going to set one to two. Now we're still inside the function. Uh, but now, you know, and this this would happen whether we call this with the by ref or not, right? Because inside this function, we've redefined one to be two. But if I didn't use the word by ref, and we'll, we'll run through this once with that, um, it suddenly, um, this next box. Oh. You, you didn't turn on the next box. Yeah. My bad. Return one. So here we go. So now I'm going to return one and we're going to, so we're in the function, it's one, then it gets changed to two, which was here and here. Now we're going to return one and it's going to come up here. Um, and notice, notice here, right here, it's two. However, and this is the, the secret, right? If I get rid of this, save this and reload it, now again, work. everything's just what it will still work because you're returning it. Oh, sorry, you, you my bad. Right there. The, now that won't work, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, thank you for stopping me before I did that. Um, if if to Jackie's point, if we did this, it, it, it still would work, right? But but the whole point is, um, right now I'm gonna I'm gonna rerun this. We're in the function. It's a one. The second message box is a two. Now here, in the one earlier with the by ref, this stayed a one. I'm, I'm sorry, it, it stayed a two. But now it's a one. Well, why is that? Because this scope keeps it all contained here. And this one, even though it looks the same to you and me, it's different than the one outside of this function, right? But the by ref takes care of that for us. And of course, this is just one, sorry, an example using one by ref, but really you'd, you'd have multiple of these things, right? Um, but to Jackie's point also, if you have a lot of memory, it's reusing that same memory address. And so it'll just help um, use less memory. And, and that's where to me also, again, with auto hotkey, I'm not doing stuff that that matters. But all right, let's go back through this again. So inside the function, it's a one, then it becomes a two. Now we're gonna return it, but because this is a by ref, it stays two. So hopefully that um, makes sense. You, know, you don't need to return it when it's by ref. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Which is which is one of the good points 
um, because you're you're referencing that other variable, you're saying that it's kind of the same thing. Um, so, and this is why also to me, I get, I still get confused if I start seeing them and, and I just prefer to handle them like using an object instead. Yeah, because a lot of the stuff we covered might seem to a lot of people like it's uh, just a global variable, but that's absolutely not what it is. All right, well, speaking of which, static and global. Um, so here, let me exit out of the, the script. And let's see here. Um, I don't, oh, I did actually have, uh, okay, I have a gap above. So here I'm gonna set sum to equal to zero. One is one and two is two, all in the digits. Uh, my function or my func is the name of my function. Here I'm calling it, here's the function, right? And we should have really, mentioned this clearer earlier when i call my function it's similar to that in a go sub in the sense that it will jump when it gets to here it jumps down to your function it doesn't go to line eight it'll jump to wherever this is and this is why often you'll have the calls to your functions at the top and function definitions you know all grouped at least grouped together would you agree with that jackie it's not yeah. some people like the functions that defined at the top and then do everything else personally i like to bury my functions or put them in an includes um, uh, but the function calls are, are all grouped together, but it's going to, it's going to go from here down into here. And now notice global is being defined as a sum. Now here's the other, to me, hard thing to remember at first, because even when I went to go write this today, it just, it took me a second because I said, oh, I'll make one a global. And when you do that, it says, Hey, you can't define your parameters as global. So it has to be something else as global. Um, and I'm like, Oh, that. Oh, okay, I get it. It just took me a minute to, to remember that. Um, and this static counter now, scope, like I said, it's a very interesting and fun thing. And, and the really great, one of the great things about it is, like I said, we can have another function, you know, called, let's just say, you know what, let's, let's do it for simplicity here. So I'm going to have another function here called my fun, uh, let's say my f, okay? Um, it also has the same variables. And everything, but they don't. I don't want to say is it contaminated the right way to how would you say that, Jackie? They don't interfere with each other because they're self contained. The yeah. I can have the exact same variable names here, although the global thing would monkey that up, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, but but the other stuff, everything else would be fine and they wouldn't interfere with each other, right? And that's it's a, both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you can get away with having shorter variable names because. They're self-contained. Everything in here is just within there. However, what happens often is you forget that you you go to access that variable, but you didn't return it. You didn't save it somewhere else. And, and so it, it, it can be a little hard to remember when you first start doing it. But it really is very beneficial because otherwise the variable names we would have to have would be crazy, crazy long. And although Jackie and I would both argue you should have somewhat long variable names, um, it does help you. All right, but let's uh, let's get back in here. So the, the global sum, we want to have access to this outside of the function without using a byref, right? In the static counter. Now, the cool thing about static is every time I call this script, these um, the one and twos, these get recreated every time. But what if I wanted a way to keep track of like how many times I've called this? Or let's say I created an object in this function and I want to reuse that object. That's where a static variable can be very helpful. It stays across function calls. So in here, and I could have, here's the, the one and two, and I easily could have just put a one and two here instead of doing it this way, right? Uh, but let me go ahead and launch it. Um, and so again, it's going to do the my function call. It's going to jump down in here, create this global sum variable, which we don't do anything with yet, um, and create a static variable called counter. And then we're going to do a sum of adding one plus two into sum, which remember sum is global, right? So sum, um, we're going to see outside of it. And our counter is going to, we're going to add one to it every time we go through this. Um, so this first part, uh, this is inside the function. Uh, the sum is three, because that's right here. Um, sorry. So inside the function, the sum is three. And it's not a surprise because, you know, we're inside the function and the counter is on one and I'm going to hit okay. And we're going to see this eight, uh, line eight. 
So after the function, now notice we're accessing sum here. And before, if I hadn't had this as global, this thing would have been blank. Um, or actually, excuse me, it would have been zero. Uh, but because we've made it global here, it returns that value. But here's the really cool part. I'm going to hit my hotkey again to trigger this function. Oh, is the message box? Sorry, message box still up. There we go. Okay. Much more exciting this way. So now notice this. So sum is still three. Um, not, but look, see my counter says two, right? Before it was one. And that's because the, the, um, the counter is right here, right? This is the second time I called this. And so this thing counts every time I call it, which can be, when you start thinking about, sometimes it's very convenient to keep track of how many times you're in somewhere. So being able to have a static variable is really helpful. Uh, and of course, as we go through now, it's after this still, this part was just demonstrating the counter and how that works. The, I'm doing it the second time or the third time. Now we're in the third time we're in the counter, right? So does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Cool. All righty. Um, returning an object or an array. Oh, let me exit out of that other script. So here I have my func, um, and in it, I have var, you know, I'm just setting the variables to equal to values, and then I shove all of these. So if the by ref thing confuses you, um, you can shove things either into an array or an object, you know, a key value pairs or however you want to store your data and return the array, and, um, and you can get your data that way. So I'm going to launch this thing. So when I hit this, it's going to call my func. Uh, it's going to store the results in this variable called cool, but it's going to go create this to create the array. Uh, here's the array with the var one, var two, var three, which would be you know one, two, and three, um, and return the array. And here I'm accessing the array in this message box, which in, in reality um, I would probably rather now that I look at it, I'd rather put it here and put a return here, um, just to help clarify. So we we start here. This is going to jump into here, do the stuff, come back, and then get to this line. So there's the one, two, three, right? So we're accessing each of these variables outside of that function, which I can't tell you how often that comes up where you have a lot of stuff you wanna get outside of your function, at least multiple things. And I like to either create an array or a key value pair and then access them directly. Oh, Jean was saying, but by ref can be dangerous if you forget the function could change the value of your parameter. Absolutely, Jean. Yeah, this is also why, again, I I stay away from by refs personally. <laughs> uh, but but I don't work with big stuff either. Did uh did anyone else have any other any questions on this on how to access this? Um and, and working with the race. Now Jean led our webinar last month on working with objects. And so you, you could learn there how how you know this is accessing that array. Uh, it's very straightforward, I think, once you get the hang of it. And then I had one more with the, the very fun to me, and I gave a very simple example here of a variadic function. So um, here we're passing, and I just notice there's um, this, my, when I define my, again, defining the function, calling the function. So this var asterisk, that's very special. It says, hey, this parameter can have, you know, a multiple um, theoretically unlimited, but we know there's limits, uh, number of parameters. And here I just passed it. I made up, this is really cool. Well, let's run it first. Let's, let's do this and run. So it's gonna loop over and we get the max index. And now we're looping over each one of those is very, really cool. Um, and notice I could, I can get rid of one of these, save, reload, and run it. This is really or and reload and run. This is really wow, neat. So it allows you to be very flexible. And of course, here's the trick is you can have a variadic function here, but you you couldn't then, or I correct me if I'm wrong here, Jackie. You can't say, um, Joe, here, I can't have a second one that's I can't have a variadic to the left, but I can have it on the right. 
Isn't that right? Yeah. Because yeah. auto hockey wouldn't know where it begins and ends. Yeah. Yeah. Because so the other one has to have an index. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, now, just for fun, um, what I also wanted to demonstrate here was I did this a second way um, with a built-in stir split function. So here, let's say I wanted to parse just like this was done, but this is the this was the same original sentence up here. This is really cool. Um, and I'm using stir split and I'm gonna parse it on every space. So I'm gonna store the results in var2 and I'm a loop of var2 with the same max index that we used up here and display the var2 and the a index. Um, so first let me comment this out. What? Oh. And this is really cool. So it did the exact same thing, right? Which to me in some ways a little simpler than my uh, variadic function did. Right. Um, I'd say the interesting part here, Joe, would be yep. to combine the two. Having var one be the thing you pass to my function. Var two from stir split, because it could be a sentence of any length with any amount of spaces. So passing that into my func. Wouldn't that give you the same result? Um, I suppose. Yeah. So you're saying, well, actually, I don't want that. I want that. And then my func. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And obviously, we enable that and put a return here. So actually, let's do it this way so people understand that's not being used. So save, reload. Oh. Oh, because you have the variable after it to the right. I don't know why Studio it must have my default zoom at, at much less. I got to figure out how to fix that. Um, so, so now we're going to do some troubleshooting. <laughs> so let's see. Far two. It well, it had an array there instead of. Yeah, it, it had an array, so it didn't like the array, right, Jackie? Yeah. That, that's yeah. what that's saying. So now you have var, which has a max index of one, probably. Um, so var a index one would probably have an actual object in it. So if you put a dot one after that, you would probably get the first word. <laughs> Where did the magic box go? I, I just hit my button. I'm sorry. Oh. So it did. Yeah, it, it comes up, but it um. So I could do it'll it would it'll have each each work because yeah. it's an array, right? Yeah. Well, and um, that was one more I was going to, and sorry, hopefully we're not confusing too many people here, but um, let me go back into here, and I wanted to demonstrate one of the things I really really like. You know, I'm gonna, I'll just bring this up to the top. What I really like about stir split is, um, so here, if I know I want the third word, I can go like this and run it and I get the third word, right? So notice I'm accessing that array without even storing the array. Right, or if I change this to a two, right, I get the is, or the one would get the this, right? So it's a super simple, easy way to access things without even creating and storing that array, right? Especially if often you want to use this in something, but you don't need to store it. Why store it as a variable, then get the index of it, whatever? I can do this, you know, in one line and it's gone. I never even stored it. Okay, I know that was a lot. Let me um, let me jump back into here just real quickly. Say, uh, uh, we covered that. We covered all those, and then the last one. So again, scope 
is a thing that will you'll want to hit your head against a wall not at first because you'll be thinking something's not right and you'll spend a lot of time wasted and then you'll realize crap you know i i didn't say i didn't return that variable i did it inside the function it's just something to get used to the other thing that will happen is you'll say hey i'll i'll just make the thing global or it's almost like jean was saying too with the byref I'll, I'll just use that but then you end up having it too short of a name and you repurpose it or reuse it and not realizing we used it elsewhere. And so they're a little more dangerous. Uh, and then the other one, which is just silly, and it's kind of like what happened, that little example where Jackie suggested moving that up was, uh, it's not exactly that, but sometimes you'll return a value and there's you'll see nothing, quote unquote, nothing in it, but it's because you returned an array or an object and you can't just use a message box to show an object. You need to dig into it and see what is there. So hopefully that wasn't too crazy. Um, I'm going to go ahead just because the timing is good. I'm going to hit stop on the recording and then we'll come back and see if there's questions or anything that anyone wants to dive into. We can do a couple examples if you want. And just the thing is baby step into them, learning them. You know, it's, it's so much easier just with practice to, to, to play with them than it is to try to watch this. I would say is give yourself four hours to sit there with a simple example and build on it slowly. So let me hit stop, and then we'll jump right back in here.